Okay, uh, we're going to talk about several topics today, mainly asteroids and meteorites, since they are related uh, pretty closely. Uh, we're going to talk about NWA 7304 and another famous one, ALH 84001. Um, then we're going to talk about some comet topics, the comet WILD2, and then we're going to calculate some isotope ratios in the last uh, few minutes of class. We're going to do some clicking, so have your clicker handy. Um, and I want to make a couple, uh, just kind of reinforce some of the concepts concerning clickers. First of all, if you miss a single lecture like today, you forgot your clicker at home, right? Okay. Uh, do not sweat it because the criterion for giving you full points is not 100% participation, but 85%. So that means that you've got maybe one or two lectures to burn, you know, depending on which lecture you, you uh, skip or which lecture your clicker skips, skips out on. So, but if you get more than two or three lectures, uh, you're asking for trouble in your grades. So uh, you got a little bit of leeway, but not infinite leeway. Another thing, uh, some of the students after class last time were asking me, hey, Dr. B, my clicker points, my score in the grades page, it says uh, questions answered as of 10, 10, 17. I only got 11 out of 15, and I've been here for every class, and I've clicked on every question. And, you know, some students, Dr. B, I only got one out of 15, or I only got five out of 15. Now there's, you know, I talked it over with some students. Um, are you gonna, and we're gonna try to work out some of the problems here today. It's, if you ever have any trouble with your clicker, just come up here front and sit with, sit up here in the front and so that way I can double check your clicking uh, as we go through class. But uh, one of the things you wanna make sure of, and, and I had some students in the first hour who said, oh, that's why. You gotta be on the right frequency. Frequency DD. Um, so, and this is especially tricky if you use your eye clicker as the morning student did, Robert, uh, with another class. And the other class, they had, you know, frequency AC or something. And so that student had to switch back and forth. And it's a pain in the butt, but you just got to do it. So the way that you do it, uh, as I've mentioned about 90 million times already, and I'll reinforce it one more time today, to get the frequency set, you hold the red power button down until the rectangle flashes in the upper left. And then you just type in DD. Our frequency is set to DD, delta, delta. All right, and then you'll get a check mark. It'll say uh, go nitro, uh, and then you'll get a check mark. And on exam days, it'll say uh, go for SPP, I think it says. All right, because it's a slightly different system. But you'll get that if you're on frequency DD, all right? And if you're not, uh, as the student this morning was, that might explain why uh, you don't have all the clicks in 15 out of 15 that you thought you probably should be having, all right? Now, another uh, thing is, you, and this is something I've been nagging you guys about for over a month now, you have to be registered through web courses uh, and that's this little uh, button in the upper left of the navigation panel in web courses, uh, any of the pages in our web courses area. So even, and, and this is true, you have to use that if you want to be counted. You have to get onto my roster. My roster, since we have 600 students, uh, we have to use the roster that uh, is generated by web courses. And uh, so you have to use that. So even if you used iClicker.com for another class, that's lovely, perfectly fine. And if it works for your other class, more power to your other instructor and more power to you. But in this class, you are going to miss out if you're not registered on, iClicker, uh, on uh, our iClicker website uh, through the web courses website. All right. Another thing that I talked about with a student 
uh, Thursday was, it may be that if you, you may not be getting your clicks uh, in if you forget to hit the refresh key when I queue a new question. And so, um, and the reason for that is there are three different modes uh, of clicking with the iClicker 2. There's the multiple choice mode, uh, and we're going to have a multiple choice question in just a minute. Uh, the multiple choice, you use the buttons, and you don't have to hit the send key. There's alphanumeric, which allows you to use the up and down arrow keys and the side to side keys to type in numbers, letters, and symbols, and then you do have to hit the send key when you finish. And then there's numeric mode, which only allows you to enter in numbers and a decimal point and maybe a minus sign, uh, and then you have to hit the send key. So all three of those, so when I switch, are you listening? If I switch from multiple choice to short answer, you've got to hit the refresh key. And I've been trying to tell you that every day, and I think maybe a few of you might not have done that or may have ignored it or missed it. Uh, when I change from short answer to numeric, you, you're going to want to hit the refresh key. And so on and so forth. So uh, I'll try to cue you when we change uh, question modes so that you can hit that refresh key. All right, so those are the three things and, and actually four things that I wanted to review with you uh, concerning clicking and your participation pointage. Uh, does anyone have another question? Dr. B, yeah. Um, the instructions are also on the back of the clicker. Yeah, I guess there's instructions on the back of the eye clicker. I mean, it's, you know. Sorry to have force you guys to have to look at the instructions, but anyway. All right, if there's no other questions, uh, let's keep going. There's a little bit of news that I want to mention to you, just came up yesterday concerning this new. Uh, observational technique that we Americans have developed and the Germans and the Italians and uh, the Japanese, I think, are, have set one up. Uh, it's a gravitational wave observatory and it's ginormous. You can't point it at anything. What you do is you use it pr pr to pretty much triangulate uh, not light waves or X-rays or ultraviolet or anything like that, but gravitational waves. And they're significantly different than light waves. They travel at the speed of light, but they're completely different. And we've got observatories now in the United States, uh, a few in Europe, and I think they've got some uh, over in uh, either China or Japan. And uh, one of the things that they uh, just announced yesterday was the gravitational wave observations from a pair of uh, a binary star system consisting of two neutron stars, they think, that smooshed together to form a black hole. And it was a cataclysmic uh, uh, event. This is what it looked like in optical. Now, this is the uh, big observatory down in one of the big observatories in South America, Las Campanas. I think it's South America where they got this one. And uh, this is what it looked like in visible light. Um, it's far away, uh, and it generated a lot of light. Uh, but it, the, the good thing about this one is it generated visible light and also gamma rays and gravitational waves. So we've got uh, three good uh, different uh, views of it, and so that's going to really help us understand that physical process. There's a couple reading articles that... <coughs> Excuse me. I came down with something over the weekend. <coughs> uh, a couple of good reading articles uh, that I've posted for you and linked in the uh, additional readings page inside web courses. Uh, and it's uh, one is from the journal Nature, which is a British journal. 
Uh, and one is from the journal Science. It's, it's an American journal. And these are both news articles. So uh, you guys should be able to tackle quite a bit of each article. In other words, there's not a lot of calculus and trig and logarithms and, you know, like for all the technical articles. And, you know, and both of those journals are just je every, every field of science, biology, geology, astronomy, physics, uh, you name it. And uh, so, uh, but these two articles uh, are pretty good and I've linked them uh, to the uh, additional readings page. Matter of fact, this diagram over here is, is from the science article and uh, it gives you an idea of the structure of the two star system uh, and how it produced a black hole and uh, a burst of gamma rays and then a burst of uh, gravitational radiation. All right, so that's in this part of the uh, additional readings page. And I've already put some readings from previous classes and I'll probably be putting a few more up here. These ones are good. Now um, about this uh, pair of, uh, of articles, these will not be on uh, exam three. And exam three is coming up a week from today. Okay, so exam three is gonna cover everything up to and including Thursday, which means comets. We're gonna, do, we're gonna tackle comets and isotope ratios uh, on Thursday. And we're actually gonna start a little bit of it today. But these two readings, you, they came up yesterday, so I'm telling you about them, uh, but we'll talk about them um, in the lead up to exam four, or maybe exam five, or exam four, or maybe the final. So, uh, but you could definitely take a peek at them if you feel like it. And they're in there uh, for your reading pleasure. Any questions about that? Okay, let's keep going. All right, uh, chapter 13, uh, we're gonna talk some more about uh, asteroids. And uh, here's a quote that I thought was uh, pretty good. Uh, the different classes of asteroids are found at different distances. The whole thing is the asteroids, w w as much as we can learn about the asteroids, uh, we believe that they tell us about the primitive or the early conditions of the solar system itself before the planets formed. And so, um, because we think that the asteroids are fragments of matter, uh, most of them, that are left over from the beginning of the, universe, beginning of the solar system that didn't quite make it into a planet. And I'll tell you about why that is in a few minutes. The S-type, the stony silicate type asteroids are about 2.2 astronomical units out. And the carbonaceous C-types, about 3.2 uh, astronomical units out. Okay, so that's a general pattern. So that's out in the, in the asteroid belt. And, you know, they tend to be, and it's not like, you know, like there's a boundary line, you know, like your neighbor's property starts here and your stops there. It's not like they're bounded like that, but it's rough um, uh, distribution, 2.2 and, and 3.2. Now, don't worry about memorizing 2.2 and 3.2 so much as the fact that uh, the two types definitely are found in different locations. And they're separated, the, the average location is separated by an astronomical unit. So that's a significant amount of distance. They're, there's a little bit of overlap, but they're, they're far enough apart that you can uh, pick them out. Now, there's other groups of asteroids, all right? And in fact, there's kind of a, a, a cool set uh, called the, uh, the Greeks and the Trojans, all right? Ooh, you can't see it down here. Uh, this uh, screen is not pulled down all the way. Uh, let me get my cursor over here. Okay, this group down here, the word Greek, it's, this is actually figure one from chapter 13. Um, these are known as the Greeks. And these ones over here, they're all out kind of 
uh, clustered on the orbit of Jupiter. They're asteroids, uh, but they're kind of um, blobbed together. Um, behind, the Trojans are behind Jupiter, and then the Greeks are ahead of Jupiter on this view. Right? If Jupiter's going uh, counterclockwise in this view, then uh, the Greeks are ahead of it, and the uh, Trojans are behind it. And that's because at these two points... Uh, on the orbit of, Sa- of, of Jupiter, uh, there's a special, um, uh, what we call a Lagrange point, uh, where objects tend to be in a stable, it's like a sweet spot. They're, they're, they're not going to, res- if they get bumped slightly in towards the sun or out away from the sun, they're going to return to that sweet spot. All right, the Lagrange point. And theoretically, if you took the average location here of the Trojans and uh, draw a line from it to the sun back to Jupiter and then from Jupiter back to that average location point of the Trojans, that would form a 60-60-60 equilateral triangle. And the same thing down here for the Greeks. Uh, From the middle of the Greeks up to the sun, then back to Jupiter, and then from Jupiter back to the Greeks, another 60, 60, 60, 90, uh, uh, equilateral triangle. Okay? And that's because of the, basically, Sir Isaac Newton, you know, the forces of gravity. Another group is called the Hilda, the Hildas, and those are kind of measured out here. Uh, it's kind of hard to make them out. Or the, these are these kind of orangey, pinkish ones. All right, but it looks really nice on the on the free textbook. Okay, so look at this diagram, Figure One, in Chapter Thirteen. And these ones are special. Uh, they're not in Lagrange points, but they're in what we call an orbital resonance. So for every two orbits of Saturn, I think it is, these things take three orbits, and every. Uh, Every third orbit at aphelion, they're out here at aphelion, farthest away from the sun, and it's when, when uh, Jupiter is passing by. And there's three places, over here, over here, and over here by the Greeks. So Greeks, there's an aphelion group here, uh, Trojans, an aphelion group, and then opposite Jupiter, another aphelion group. All right, so the Hildas are, tend to be um, tugged out into that particular orbit where they have an aphelion every, that, that is right next to Jupiter every time Jupiter goes around twice and every time it goes around uh, three times. I think it's a three to two ratio. Now, another thing I want to mention to you is uh, the asteroids that are off of the asteroid belts and one of those is the uh, near earth object called eros all right and eros is an s type asteroid uh, and we sent the near spacecraft and now it's called near shoemaker after uh professor shoemaker that figured out all this stuff about he's the one that was looking at that church in Holland and figured out that it was built of shot glass from a meteor, uh, from a comet impact or asteroid impact. Um, I think his name is Gene, Eugene Shoemaker. Uh, Anyways, uh, this one, they sent this out in, I don't know, the late 90s. And by about the year 2000, it was out there and it was able to orbit the constant, the, uh, Asteroid Eros, uh, here it is, um, like a moon. And we do that a lot now. We send um, uh, spacecraft out uh, to, uh, uh, to make orbits, especially for an irregularly shaped object like that. Now, that's kind of a potato-shaped object. I actually think it looks like, uh, you know, like a ballerina did you ever see a ballerina and they get up on their tiptoes and, and they have those special shoes that have the, the toe air. Are you, do you wear them? Yeah. Point shoes. So 
So point shoe technology. And I always think that this thing, now here's, what, here's the way I look at it, all right? Now you may think, Dr. B, you're out to lunch on this, but I'll just explain the way I look at it. Up here where my cursor is, that's the toe. The sole of the foot is over here. So the sole of this foot, here's a big hole in their shoe, on the bottom of their shoe. And then right over here, closer to us, is the heel, all right? And then here's the back of the shoe. And see how this dips in here, right here? That's where your shoe goes, that's where your foot goes in. All right, so, the, so I don't know, that's, that's the way I think it looks. And if you look at the Eros asteroid, they got movies of it, all kinds of different angle shots. You might, you know, it might look like something else to you, and you know, that's good. But to me, it looks like ballet dancer shoe. Anyways, figure seven from the textbook. And here's something interesting. Um, several other asteroids have been revealed as to be made of loosely bound rubble throughout, but not Eros. Its uniform density about the same as that of Earth's crust and extensive global scale grooves and ridges show that it is cracked but solid rock. So this is probably a fragment of something. You know, whether another like series, it's, a, it's basically, you know, a student asked me in the first class, how big is it, Dr. B? And I could not answer, but now I can answer. It's... Um, <clears throat> Maybe uh, you could lay it down inside Orange County, you know. So maybe, uh, you know, 20 kilometers long and, uh, and so forth. So uh, from, tip to t from the tip of the shoe to the heel of the shoe. Um, so you could lay it down in, in, uh, and so you could walk around it very carefully uh, in a couple days. You know, see, 20 kilometers out, that's 12 miles. And of course, actually, gravity's really weak, so you could jump, like, totally high. But the thing about it is, gravity's really weak, so if you jump too high, you might not come back down. So you could, you know, l launch yourself into space. But anyways, you could walk around it if you keep, keep your foot on the ground. Now, something interesting about this, you know, it's the first... It's the first uh, asteroid that we got a spacecraft up close and personal. Matter of fact, we landed it back in 2001. And this spacecraft, it was not meant to be landed. It's not a lander. It's a satellite. It's a, an orbiter. It's, it's got, you know, big solar panels and, you know, a radar dish to beam stuff back to Earth. But it doesn't have landing feet. It doesn't have wheels doesn't have wings, it doesn't have anything for landing. You know, the, the rovers up on Mars, like Curiosity and stuff, um, and all the, the systems that, you know, where they land on Mars, those things are set up for landing, you know, various different ways. You know, parachutes, and, you, know, you know, bounce, they, they put them in a kind of a bounce house type thing, and, you know, bounces across the surface for a little way, and before it rolls to a stop, and, 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 you know, just regular jet uh, or uh, rocket, descent rockets and stuff. Uh, but not, uh, not the near Shoemaker uh, spacecraft. But by God, we landed it. Soft landing. And it still works. They turned it off. But it was, it was transmitting data uh, for several hours after it landed. It didn't smash into smithereens. So it's still up there, and your children, your grandchildren's grandchildren might go up there and say, you know, they're out there, out in the asteroid belt, and they're thinking, oh man, my spaceship needs something. I'll go down to Eros and see if we can get the, we can get the near shoemaker thing to get, keep, to, you know, kickstart it. It'll, it'll start. Unless it gets obliterated by another meteorite or something like that, you know. Because th this thing is loaded with craters, so, I mean, it does get impacts and stuff. But yeah, it's still up there. It's, some, of these, some of these spacecraft, you know, NASA's had some spectacular misses. 
You know, that when, in, back in the 40s and 50s when they were first designing rockets to, you know, not to just get up into orbit, Earth orbit, they had enormous numbers of failures. And unfortunately, we've had uh, a loss of life. You know, the Challenger and the Columbia and Apollo, uh, Apollo 1, and the Russians have, have lost people. Uh, but some of the machines, like Hubble, oh my goodness, the Hubble Space Telescope is still up there. And this thing's still up there too. Matter of fact, landing this thing on the asteroid Eros is about like landing the Hubble Space Telescope on Eros. You know, Hubble Space Telescope's meant to be in orbit. It's not designed for impact or anything. In fact, it's designed, it's, it's ultra sensitive and you don't want to, you know, give it any kind of a bang at all if you can help it. Um, so if <coughs> landing the near Shoemaker on there is, is, is like landing the Hubble Space Telescope. And, you know, that would be cool if we could get the Hubble Space Telescope on this baby. Because then you could make, you think of the baseline you've got, you know, for triangulation. It'd be uh, super, super duper. Uh, in general, uh, asteroids are cratered, and uh, if you did your reading, you know that cratering and counting craters is important. Uh, most of them, they're not big enough for, um, for them to form a spherical shape or an, an almost spherical shape. You know, Earth is not perfectly spherical. It's oblate, slightly flattened. Uh, and uh, the biggest asteroid is, is also, Ceres is also flattened. Uh, but in general, uh, a lot of them are just loose piles of rubble, uh, just kind of irregular shape, uh, but they take craters. So let me ask you a clicker question here. Your first one for the day. Um, what does crater counting say about Gaspra and Ida? Did you do your reading? Okay, 10 seconds to vote. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. See now, if I click this and you haven't voted, then that's, a, that's one that you, you didn't get your vote in. Okay, so uh, anyways, um, answer to this one is uh, C. And let me see, uh, question one, ooh, ooh, more of you voted for uh, B. B is tempting, uh, and if you voted for B, that means A, you didn't read carefully enough, uh, and C, and, 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 and number two, uh, you got tempted because that is approximately the age of the solar system. But we, the whole thing about the cratering is there's not enough cratering on these two to make them. So, for instance, not enough to make them look like the moon. The moon's been up there taking uh, asteroid and comet shots for about four and a half billion years, we think. Pretty close. All right. And it's covered with them. Uh, but Ida and Gaspra, not so much. So we think it's a little bit <clears throat> sooner. A uh, few of you voted for A. Now, is there anything that you notice about option A? Nineteen eighty-eight divisible by four. There was no September thirty-first in nineteen eighty-eight, <laughs> or in any other year. 
So if you ever see me type in the date September 31st on a multiple choice test like this, then... <laughs> now, did you guys click? Uh, did you get your click in? And where was... Uh, good. Uh, did you get your click in? Van Wagner, where are you at? Uh, okay, I guess he's not around. Uh, okay, so you guys got got your clicks in, good. Uh, all right, let's talk about series. Now, I've got a size comparison here. Uh, roughly the size of series, this is, a, this is kind of an oblate spheroid here, this gray shape. Uh, it's, it sizes uh, 974 kilometers by 910. That's pretty big compared to us humans. All right, but it's not very big compared to the other planets. Uh, so the major axis, 974 kilometers, uh, would be about Orlando to Nashville for distance. Here's a, um, a circle uh, centered on Chicago. Radius 960, so that's roughly, the if, if Ceres was a, a sphere, it would be about 960 kilometers radius. Uh, so uh, it, go, it covers up most of Minnesota, uh, all of Iowa and Missouri, uh, most of Tennessee, all of Tennessee and Kentucky, a bunch of other states, Michigan, of course. So don't even think about Ceres impacting Earth. You know, we talked about uh, Enceladus impacting Florida. You know, this is bigger than Enceladus. Ceres is, is an asteroid. It's actually, it's considered a dwarf planet now. Uh, and it's bigger than Enceladus. Enceladus would fit inside the circle a couple times. So, now we've got some spacecraft up there. These are pictures from the Hubble Space Telescope. And Hubble's, Hubble's an amazing machine. They can see, <coughs> I think that, that with the Hubble Space Telescope, they can pick out a basketball uh, on the surface of the moon with the Hubble Space Telescope. Now just think about that. The Hubble Space Telescope, looking at stars, moons, galaxies, and then think about the CIA operated another 10 of them, but pointing down towards the Russians. And I'm afraid that that's what, they don't tell you too much about that, but I guarantee you they got a bunch of them up there looking at the Russians in uh, North Korea in every orbit. They go around, they're looking at the Koreans and stuff. I guarantee it. Uh, it's a fantastic telescope. And uh, now that the Cold War is over, uh, they could probably talk about it, but they're still hushing their mouths about, about that. Uh, anyways, a series, and here's Vesta. Vesta is uh, not perfectly circular, although it does look, whoa, it does look like it used to be circular. It's got a big blast, you know, a big chunk of it blasted out. And we've had the Dawn spacecraft out there, uh, looking at Vesta and Ceres, and it spent a good, uh, you know, hundreds of orbits uh, studying Vesta, these, these unusual bright spots. These, these things here that you can see on Ceres, uh, we're still trying to figure out what those are. And we've had this Dawn spacecraft up there looking at them. We can see them on, on uh, Vesta as well. Uh, right now, Dawn is orbiting Ceres, so it's, it's moved over to study Ceres uh, on its uh, planned trajectory. Vesta is the fourth largest uh, asteroid, and uh, Vesta is, is important because uh, we think that we have fragments of Vesta that have fallen to Earth. All right, so make a note of that in your notes. Vesta is an important asteroid because we have meteorites that have fallen, for instance, up in North Carolina, that we think are pretty, pretty sure 
actually are fragments blasted like smithereens off the surface of Vesta. And here it is. This is called Moore County. It's about two kilograms in mass. Uh, it's probably maybe the size of a grapefruit or so, although it's not round. Uh, you can see, look at that. You can see that it's got scarring and streaking from entering the Earth's atmosphere. See, it's kind of glazed in the heat. That's glass. That's not just, you know, that's just not, you know, that's not some guy at the, uh, at the museum th saying, okay, well, let me shine it up really nice. Let me put some, shoe, some clear shoe polish or, or some clear nail polish and buff it up there. No. It came through Earth's atmosphere looking like that. All right. And it looks like a piece of rock. Matter of fact, um, this one is similar. It's, it's a mineral called eucrite, E-U-C-R-I-T-E. And it's similar to basalt. Now, <clears throat> here in Florida, our bedrock is limestone. It's kind of whitish, very light colored, soft limestone, sedimentary rock. A bunch of coral, shells, um, and other stuff, plankton, uh, laid down on the bottom of the ocean, so thick that it became a rock. And that's the rock that forms the Florida Peninsula. Uh, but this is uh, basalt. In, in uh, 2D, I say basalt's very common on Earth. You know where you find basalt? A bunch of places. Uh, the, the most abundant place is the ocean floor. The Atlantic, the floor of the Atlantic, the bedrock is uh, basalt, basalt-type rocks. And there's volcanoes that, that blaze up, you know, like Iceland is in the middle of the Atlantic. It's basically a bunch of volcanoes, Hawaii and stuff. So there's a little bit of variation, but most of the uh, bedrock of the oceans is uh, basalt. It's a dark, igneous uh, mineral. Uh, raise your hand if you've ever been to Hawaii for like vacation or something. Okay, nice. Raise your hand. Okay, take your hands down. Now raise them again if you've been to Hawaii and if you went to one of those beaches where they have black sand. Is it nice there? Is it, it's a really nice beach and stuff. That black sand is from uh, basalt-like. It's from lava, you know, and it, and, but it's dark. The, the same color as that sand, that's what basalt is like. Another place that you find basalt is uh, a couple places on continents. There are small basalt formations here and there around in the continent, but there's a big, big basaltic lava flow in the Indian subcontinent. It's called the Deccan Plateau. Let me spell that for you. D-E-C-C-A-N, the Deca, the Deccan Plateau. And so it's, you know, the middle of the Indian subcontinent. And they think, you know, as India, as a subcontinent smashed into the southern side of Asia and raised up the Himalaya mountains, uh, part of that same process was these enormous um, flows of basalt that formed this uh, enormous region called the Deccan Plateau. Another place where we have it, is here in America, uh, all the way on the other side of the, of the nation, in uh, Oregon and Washington State, the uh, Columbia Plateau, okay? And if you've ever heard of the, raise your hand if you've ever been to Yellowstone, Yellowstone National Park, Fuvius, okay? Just to the west of Yellowstone is something, in fact, I think part of Western uh, Yellowstone or Grand Teton, the Snake River forms up in those same mountains and flows, uh, kind of curls around through Idaho and then up into the Columbia. And, the, and all of uh, Idaho, uh, great plains of Idaho, Oregon, 
and Washington that form the Columbia River Basin uh, is also extensive basaltic lava flows. And it's a high altitude desert. And I, they call it the inland, if, you're, if you live out there, they call it the inland empire. And I used to live out there, my old stomping grounds out west. Uh, and it uh, gets a lot of snow in the winter, unlike uh, India. Uh, but uh, yeah, that, that, that's another place. And I think there's a place in Siberia where there's, uh, if I'm not mistaken, where there's extensive basaltic lava flows. And there's smaller ones, like there's, there's some small mini lava flows in New Jersey. Uh, raise your hand if you've ever been to New York City. Okay, if you've ever been to New York City and you've seen the Palisades on the New Jersey side of the Hudson River, raise your hand if you've seen those, the Palisades. Those are basaltic uh, cliffs. And they're not very gigantic or anything, but they're, you know, they're big enough to, to see from uh, New York City. Uh, so that's what we think this is. Um, now, how do they analyze that? Well, one of the things they look at when they, when they, uh, <coughs> they analyze this meteorite, the isotopes in the rock. And, they've, and now that we've had the, near, or the uh, Dawn spacecraft out there studying Vesta, and series, we know all about the chemical composition of those babies. All right, so we're pretty confident that this is actually a fragment. And there's other fragments of Vesta that have fallen to Earth. This is, this is the one closest to us, uh, up there in Moore County, uh, North Carolina. It fell in 1913. Now, I want to uh, give a challenge to everyone here. And that is, if you ever find a meteorite, you know, this one's maybe the size of a grapefruit. It's a hefty rock. All right. You have found something that is extremely valuable. And all kinds of uh, scientists in the physics department at UCF would love to have, you know, even a gram of a, mic uh, of a meteorite like this to analyze and study because it tells us a lot about the uh, origin of the solar system. Uh, so if you find one, you found something uh, valuable. And I'm going to give you a couple more uh, meteorites here, one from Northwest Africa and one from Antarctica, and we're going to talk about them. And those are two places, the Sahara Desert and Antarctica, that for some reason, we've gotten a lot of meteorites there. Now, you may think to yourself, okay, if it burns up so hot in the atmosphere, how does it survive in Antarctica? Because won't it freeze and, you know, or won't it melt all the snow? And, you know. But no, we, found, we've, we could find stuff down in Antarctica. Antarctica, they say, is like a desert. I've heard people say that. I've never been, to, anybody here been in Antarctica? Yeah, it, I'd like to go one of these days, but, but apparently there's some places there. And the nice thing is it's, it's light color, it's snow and ice. So if you see a rock, you'll see it three miles away. If it's up there on the surface of the snow, same thing in the Sahara desert. If there's something freshly fallen, it'll be obvious. Now this one here, Moore County, fell up in North Carolina. So there's, there's no desert there. There's no ice fields and glaciers. Probably what happened in 1913, it fell and it crashed in a forest and somebody saw it coming in. Raise your hand if you've ever seen a really good shooting star. Okay, I've seen some really good ones. Okay, and if the shooting star, you know, which is a meteorite coming in or a meteor coming in, uh, and then when you pick it up off the ground, that's a meteorite. Uh, if it comes in and you can see it land, a lot of times they're so hot that they'll start a, f a fire. You know, it'll turn, it'll, you know, uh, you know, knock down a tree and then set the tree on fire. And that's probably what happened up there. But in Northwest Africa, things are a little different. Not many trees there, but you can still see things easily. Here's Northwest Africa 7304. The nickname for this rock 
uh, this space rock, this meteorite, is Black Beauty. Somebody just gave it a nickname. Now look at the surface of this. See this over here? It's kind of crackly looking, but see how it's got kind of a, a, a glaze to it? That's from re-entry, not from re-entry, that's from entering the atmosphere. Now, what they do with these things, uh, most meteorites, they'll try to um, analyze the chemical composition and structure. So what they do is they take a, real, a, a really good diamond saw and they saw a few thin slices off. And so this front face where my cursor is there, um, that's a face exposed after they took a few layers off. So a few, few layers off, went off to some scientist's lab and they're still probably there having been analyzed. And this is uh, probably, I don't know who owns this one. Somebody owns it, you know, like University of Georgia or something like that. Uh, we own some meteorites, the University of Central Florida. But you can see in this, it's gray, like basalt. But we don't think it's exactly like the, the, Vest, the fragment of Vesta. It's not like Moore County. But look at all those little, do you see the specks? Look up there. Look at it. You see those specks? These specks, look at that. Here's a dark one. Yeah, those are minerals. So we shave off a layer or a couple layers and, we, and then we try to analyze everything in there, including these little, what we call inclusions. And some of those inclusions are really, really interesting. You know, they have, uh, some of them are depleted of calcium. Some of them are enriched in calcium. And see, that tells us, clues or gives us clues about the origin of the solar system. NWA 7304. And there's tons of meteorites for which the prefix is NWA for Northwest Africa. You know, Mor they think this one came down somewhere in Morocco. The, the guy that found it was not the guy who sold it. He gave it to another guy and that guy went into... Uh, Marrakesh or, or whatever the city was uh, and sold it for buku dineros. So the guy that, uh, that found it probably didn't get a lot of money for it. Anyway, NWA 73. Oh, by the way, yeah, it's from Mars. It's a fragment of Mars. And you know what we think? We think that there's some rock formations on Mars that are dark, basaltic-like uh, rock layers. Yeah, we think this is a fragment from Mars. Um, and here's another one from Mars, ALH84001. Now this one is extremely controversial. Go ahead and make a note of this one, ALH84001. Uh, orthopyroxenite with manganese and iron. Um, Uh, some scientists claim that it contains fossilized life forms. Now, on this one, you can see down here, the, this metal ruler uh, is centimeters. So this is maybe 9 or 10. Let's see, 2 through 11. So it's maybe 9 centimeters across. So it's like, about, so about like this, maybe. You know, maybe softball size. And you can see right here, this front face, they've uh, sawed off a few thin layers. You know what they do with it? Go ahead and make a note of it. Uh, when they analyze these, they, they take one of these really thin layers from, and, and this is from any rock, but especially from these, and they shine x-rays on it and see if stuff will start to fluoresce. Because the x-rays, the energy of the x-rays and the color of the fluorescent tells you about the chemical composition. And then they'll do ultraviolet and see if ultraviolet, you know, various wavelengths of ultraviolet, you know, like UVAB, UVAA, or UV, ultraviolet A, ultraviolet B. You know, they'll shine different uh, uh, wavelengths of ultraviolet, see what fluoresces. 
And infrared, they probably, you know, I bet they do infrared studies of this stuff too. You know, see what, see what happens, what, how it pop, snap crackles and pops. Question? So uh, can they carbon date that or no? This one is not carbon datable. Carbon dating is only good for a few thousand years. So we use other uh, radiometric dating. Uh, I believe they used uh, uranium and lead dating on this because it's a pretty old piece of rock. Now, this one is a piece of Mars. And I remember uh, up in Vermont, um, we had a, fi a, a woman uh, named Jill Tarter who came to give uh, a talk at University of Vermont. Very famous woman, astronomer. And if you've ever seen that movie Contact with Jodie Foster about um, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, uh, she's the real life person uh, on whom that movie is based. Except for the fact that her dad was an alien in the movie and stuff like that. I don't think that's true. But yeah, Jill Tarter is a real life person and she was very interesting. And one of my, to my everlasting glory and, and joy, I, I took all my physics students to her lecture and for extra credit. And uh, I had about 40 physics students. And to my everlasting joy, one of those students uh, Erica Taylor asked Jill Tarter a question. She, this, so she's a big shot, right? Jill Tarter. You know, the movie Contact, Search for Extraterrestrial, the SETI project. Big shot, right? Fame, but my student asked a question. She was bold because she was a geology major. And so uh, Jill Tarter was talking about this rock. And so my, my student, Erica, said... She raised her hand. She asked a question. How do you know it's from Mars? And here's what Dr. Tartar said. She said, we know it's from Mars because when you look at it under a microscope, you can see small spheres of glass. And that glass is from the heating and sudden cooling of the rock during the process in which it was blasted off the surface of Mars. And she said, it was so hot and then it cooled so suddenly that it formed little tiny bubbles of, or little tiny spheres of glass. They call it impact glass. And Jill Tartar, she said one more thing. They looked even more carefully at those little spheres of glass and they noticed that there were bubbles inside those spheres. And so they decided to make tiny, tiny excavations and extract what was in the bubbles. And they analyzed it. And it was the exact same composition as the atmosphere of Mars. And that is how they knew that this thing came from Mars. They found it in, uh, in Antarctica. ALH stands for Allen Hills the Allen Hills Ice Field. It's a big glacier uh, area. So go ahead and write that down, Allen Hills, named after some guy named Allen. And they picked it up there, they didn't know what they had, but somebody analyzed it and they found in those little glass, in those little spheres of glass, and in the, inside those little spheres of glass, they found little tiny remnants of the atmosphere of Mars. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. And this is what else they found. Look at this. That's good. Look at that. Black and white. Grayscale image. This is an electron uh, microscope image. What is that? Look at it. Don't look at your phone. Come on, look at that. Don't look at your phone. Look at that. It does look like a worm. But it's really... What else does it look like? Bacteria, maybe? 
Yeah, that's right. A rod, rod-shaped bacterium. Uh, that's what somebody else said this morning. Coral. I've never heard that, but I, you know, now that, you know, the student has mentioned it this morning. Yeah, maybe coral. Now, not all scientists agree with that. Some scientists say, no, it's too small. And it is really small. It's smaller than coral. It's smaller than worms. It's smaller than amoebas. But what is it? We, we want to know. You know, inquiring minds want to know, as the saying goes. Now, here's a bunch of guys that think, yeah, they found something. And here's the second sign of life on Mars. This is something I've mentioned before. This is the um, famous, famous finding of methane plumes rising from the surface of Mars at certain times of the year. Here's B1, B2, and surface A. Terra Sabe, Nili Fosse. These are all Latin names, I guess. Uh, the Nile Cliffs. Certus Major and the Sabean Earth, Sabean Ground. Anyways, this red means that they've seen a lot of methane there, a plume of it. You know, like if, if you went to the surface of the moon and you had a, a breathing tube out of your s- space suit that let you breathe out and, and didn't let any, you know, outer space in, then there'd be a, pl- a measurable plume of CO2 coming out of your spacesuit, right? This is, me- and these are gigantic. These are l- large plumes uh, filled with methane. And here are the, here the, you can go ahead and write uh, down, uh, MJ Muma, M-U-M-M-A, et al., a bunch of Italian guys. Um, if I recall correctly, Science, jur- the journal Science, 2009. Uh, and this is a technical article, but you can look at the pictures. Um, and it definitely is, uh, the import of it is seasonal methane. So we're looking at asteroids, and we got things, that, this is from one of the orbiters. You know, they're looking at uh, images and analysis, uh, basically looking at spectra. They're looking at the spectrum of methane. So probably infrared, my guess. I'll have to reread the article. But uh, yeah, they're looking at uh, from an orbiter uh, at these particular places and no others. And so they're thinking something there, you know, Allen Hills 84001 is nice, but what about this? This is another sign that maybe there's life on Mars, production of methane on a seasonal basis. So asteroids, they're meteorites, they're pretty, they're pretty, you know, you've got to study them carefully. Okay, let's talk about comets, and we're going to get into some calculations here. Have your clicker and your calculator ready. We're going to do a calculation here for a few, in a few minutes. Now, I want you to take a look at Halley's Comet, Halley's Comet. That's the nucleus of it. We got a spacecraft to fl- uh, fly by it a number of years ago and snapped some photos like this one. Uh, and you can see the white stuff surrounding it like a, like, almost like a halo. That's called the coma, from which we get the word comet. Uh, and that means that it's, uh, it, it's basically ejecting gases uh, out of uh, its nucleus, out of this nucleus. So, it's basically boiling. The sun is it's close enough to the sun that the sun is heating up the CO2 ice and the water ice and the ammonia, all the different substances that it's got. And they're evaporating out into space. And now they're catching sunlight and reflecting it back towards the camera. And it looks like that plume that you can see. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about comets. Here's a close-up of some uh, comets um, here's the orbit of Halley's Comet. It goes out past Neptune uh, and then back a little bit past Neptune. Uh, orbital period of about 76 years, or 86 years, I guess. And this, one, this green one is, called, is the comet Hayakutake. 
And it's very, very eccentric. Uh, Hayaku Taki is a very long uh, baseline comet, uh, like on the order of 20,000 years. Right, so we won't be seeing uh, Comet Hayaku Taki. It came about 20 years ago, 20, 22 years ago, to visit the inner solar system. And it won't be back for another, I don't know, 10, 15,000 years, somebody said. And then here's a couple that are inside the orbit of Jupiter, and they're, they're actually uh, oriented to Jupiter. We think they've been kind of captured by Jupiter. Jupiter is this big player. You know, the asteroid belt exists because of Jupiter. The ast- so go ahead back to your asteroid notes and add this. The asteroid belt exists because Jupiter exists. Jupiter prevents all that matter in the asteroid belt from... Um, getting a chance to gather together into a planet. Ceres is there, but that's about it. That's about as big as it gets. Ceres is kind of small. All right? And so Jupiter disrupts and discombobulates all that stuff. Now, every other planet, we think, or the interior of the solar system looked a lot like the asteroid belt before the planets formed. But inside of the asteroid belt, around the orbit of Mars, there was enough stuff. And they, did, they weren't dis- discombobulated by Jupiter, and they formed the planet Mars. A little, and then stuff a little bit further in formed the planet Earth. A little bit in from there, enough of it got together and formed the planet Venus and Mercury. But the asteroid belt is so close to Jupiter that it, it just keeps pulling it, anything apart, and it cannot make... Um, it cannot make a planet. It, it would be a very big planet anyways. But uh, anyway, so Wild 2 and Temple 1, let's get a little close up on those. Wild 2 is the one that we're going to talk about on Thursday. So in addition to your, to, in your homework between now and Thursday is to read carefully now at the end of chapter 13. I ask you to skim the sections over the weekend on comets. Now read them carefully, and we're going to start talking about them on Thursday. And read as much as you can about Wild 2. There's lots out there about it. Uh, because Wild 2, it's a little bit, it, it goes out a little bit further than uh, Saturn, or a little bit further than Jupiter. And Temple 1 is another one uh, that comes close to Earth. Uh, and uh, they form uh, meteor, uh, meteor showers, uh, the, the debris that, is left in the dust uh, behind these comets as they pass. You know, it's not just a rock. It leaves, you know, it's like, you know, a truck going down a dusty road. You know, the, it raises the dust and you can see it for miles. And when the earth passes through that trail of dust, it's a meteor shower. Okay. And so uh, now, wild two, or as they say that the official pronunciation is wild two, if you're from Germany or wherever they were, whoever, in, whoever discovered it, Professor von Wild. Anyways, Wild 2, I use, I use the American pronunciation, um, is important for us because we set the Stardust spacecraft at, to interrogate Wild 2. And what we did was send out this, see this tennis racket structure right here? That's the collector. We sent the Stardust spacecraft, you know, and down here are the solar panels, you know, and here's the radar dish to beam stuff back to NASA. Uh, we sent it out there specifically so that it could fly through the coma, you know, through the dust trail of Wild 2, fairly easy to reach comet, and then bring samples back. You know, we sent the Apollo astronauts to the moon, and the big thing there was getting uh, men up there on the moon, getting photographs, leaving um, scientific equipment on the moon, and then also bringing back moon rocks. That was a big deal, right? So we can't, you know, we're not sending astronauts. We sent a machine, and it wasn't looking for rock. They would love to have some rocks from the nucleus, but so they, they flew through the coma uh, and trying to get some, some of the coma dust, stardust, into that tennis racket. Now, here's the tennis racket up close. 
Was that me or you? Okay. Uh, and what this is, see this kind of grayish, clearish stuff? That's called aerogel. Aerogel. And it's a form of silicon. And it's extremely light. Uh, and it is, but it's rigid. And so what they did was they, you know, crafted several slabs of aerogel and put it into this aluminum frame. That's the tennis racket. And then they hooked it up to the spacecraft. You know, they, you know, they stored it so it wouldn't get any, you know, stuff during launch and everything like that. But then once it got out towards Wild 2, they deployed the tennis racket upward and flew it through the comet. And they got stuff. And then they, they, they fired the retro rockets so that we would go on a return path to Earth and jettison a small capsule with the tennis racket in it back to Earth, you know, parachute it back into to the surface. And by God, we got it. And we've got comet stardust. Um, and here's a picture of Wild 2. Um, some really good stuff that they found with Wild 2. We're going to talk about it Thursday. Let's get a head start on it. Last 10 minutes of class. Um, isotope ratios. Now we're going to do some calculations here. And it's going to look bodacious. But it's not that bad. But you've got to have a calculator. So if you don't have your calculator... Uh, break out your cell phone. And <clears throat> I can't tell you what's going to be on exam three. But if it, by some chance, I give you an isotope ratio, by some wild, crazy stroke of chance, you get an isotope ratio, you're going to want to have a regular calculator because it's going to be tricky to do it by hand. But you can if you're brave. All right, what we're going to do is calculate oxygen isotope ratios, and you can do it for other isotopes, you know, carbon, hydrogen. Um, and what you do is you, first you take down the, the baseline, and for us the baseline is SMOW, standard mean ocean water, uh, for which the 18 oxygen, the heavy the heavy oxygen isotope, abundance is 2,005.20 parts per million ppm. All right? So that's the rough abundance to six significant figures for uh, oxygen. So for every million oxygen atoms, 2,005.2 are oxygen 18s. And then 380 approximately are oxygen 17s. And then the rest is regular good old oxygen 16, eight protons, eight neutrons. All right, question. Can you just clarify what SMOW stands for? Standard mean ocean water. Okay, thank you. And it is the... Um, result of analyzing ocean water from all over the earth and just kind of, you know, you know, filtering out the oxygen 18s and the oxygen 17s and just keeping a tally. And roughly the oceans of earth have this much of a variation. Most of it's good old oxygen 16, but, you know, there's the... So, so when we're looking at oxygen ratios, oxygen isotopes, in a meteorite or a comet or something like or anything really, you know, they, they, they look at oxygen ratios for ice cores from the Greenland glacial ice cap. Uh, anywhere you look at it, you compare it to something, and for oxygen, it's usually standard mean ocean water. Now, carbon, they, if you're looking at carbon uh, isotopes, you have a different uh, baseline. Uh, it's, they don't use ocean water. They use a limestone formation up in uh, South Carolina. but <coughs> So that's your baseline. So that's standard mean ocean water. Then what you do is you take your meteorite into the lab and you do 
uh, with your meteorite, what a thousand guys have done with ocean water, you know, take a thousand samples of ocean water and analyze it. Now you do the same thing with your meteorite and see if it comes in the same or different. So let's say that your um, meteorite comes in with 2406 parts per million, a little bit more, all right, of oxygen 18. And let's say that um, you're going to calculate your, there's your calculation, by the way. That's the ratio. So it, it, the delta 18 ratio is simply your meteorite's abundance, in this case 2406, and then divide that into, or divide that by the SMOW abundance, which is 2005.20, and then subtract one, and that's your, your delta. That's your delta ratio, all right? Now, I'm going to give you oxygen 17 because in, in this example, uh, we're going to be calculating, I'm going to calculate the uh, delta 18 oxygen ratio with you, and then you're going to do delta 17 on iClicker. Just a second. All right, so let's do this carefully, all right? And uh, take careful notes, and then just replicate it when you get to the iClicker question in a minute. All right, so have your eye clicker ready, have your calculator ready, and be ready to ask questions as we go through this. All right, so here's your, um, here's your calculation. First step, just put in your abundance, 2406 ppm, and then the SMOW um, standard abundance. That's my reference, you know, so, uh, and that's 2,005.20 ppm. Now, ppm, top and bottom, cancel. All right, so that's nice. But you still have to divide 2,406 by 2,005.20. Go ahead and do that right now. Calculate that on your calculators. And I've done it on the next slide. What do you get? Who's got a number that they... They trust. Hold on. No, uh, anybody over here? You uh, with the calculator? Nobody uh, over here in the middle. What do you got? Yeah. Jinx, you owe me a coke. One point. Is that what you have? One point one nine nine. Oh, so you have this? Yes. Okay. Good. All right, so, there, so go ahead and verify that and jot it down. And, and, and they subtract one. That's the easy part. So there's your delta 18 oxygen ratio, 0 0.19988. All right, now I'm going to round that off. What is that percentage-wise? About 20%. So go ahead and write down 20%. Now, in oxygen, in isotope ratios, you know what they normally do? They report the oxygen or the isotope ratio, not in percent, but in per mil, in parts per thousand. So this would be 200 parts per thousand. See that? Ah! It's... Okay, you can see it down there at the boom. This is like a percentage. Oh, man. This is burning me. Uh, the parts per thousand or per mil, it looks like a percentage sign, but instead of a zero on the bottom, it's two zeros. You can see it down there if you peek underneath the screen. Yeah, and it's 200. So 200 divided by 1,000 is 0.1, is 0.20. 200 divided by 100, or 20 divided by 100 is 20%, All right? So uh, the, the usual thing is that it's uh, reported in per mil. Um, and so basically, this is a positive number, and it's really positive. So you would say that this is highly enriched in oxygen 18. You got a positive number, and it's really positive. Now compare that to 
for instance, Allen Hills. Allen Hills, 8400. Well, wait a minute. Let me, before we do that, let me pause for other questions. Any questions about this calculation? Yes. If you get a negative number, that means you're depleted. Okay. And the oxygen 17 is depleted. So when you're doing this on your clicker, you're going to be getting a negative number. And it all comes out because the, the, the quotient there in the square brackets will be smaller than one. If your abundance is less than SMOW, that fraction will be smaller than one. A fraction smaller than one minus one will be a negative number. All right, so it comes out naturally. Yeah, Desiree. So which answer would we put? Just the 24? I'm going to ask you for per mil. So you would put down 200. And I'll give you an example of how that works when we get to it. So here's Allen Hills 84001, the famous Martian meteorite. And hey, one of the things that they did, they, they analyzed oxygen isotope ratios. Yeah, it comes in at uh, positive 4.6, so a little bit more enriched. That's more, that's more normal. 200 is, you know, kind of artificially enriched, which they can do in a lab. And other meteorites have been measured and stuff, and you can look it up easily. Now, hit refresh key. Everybody, the blue refresh key, the one that looks like this, hit that because we're going to do uh, a numeric question. Here it is. Calculate delta-17 oxygen for your meteorite. And remember, it has an abundance of 342 parts per million. So do with oxygen-17 what you just did with oxygen-18. There's your formula down there. And type in your answer per mil. So, if, so here's the example, Desiree. If you come up with negative 0 0.0453, then type in negative 45. You know, take the first three digits and the minus sign, and then take out a after the decimal point, and then just remove the decimal point, basically. All right, now, um, consult with your neighbors and stuff, and just kind of kibitz and... And that'll be great. Uh, oh boy. Question. Put a minus sign and then 45, if that's your answer. So go to the, go to the decimal point, strip the decimal point, and then take the next three numerals, all right? And then, okay, so that's 0 0.4, that's 0 0.45, and then the minus sign in front of it. Anybody get? A hundred negative? I see a bunch of you with a hundred, and I see some with 99. Negative. Uh, okay, I'm going to close. Type in, type in your answer fast because we got to dismiss. You're dismissed as soon as you get your answer in. I'll see you Thursday. We'll do it some more on Thursday. Wait, Did I you just, get your clicker? No, I just messed up. Dude. Wait, one. Wait a minute. Are you clicking okay? Young lady? Oh, that's right, right? Are you? Did you get your? All right, come on up here to the front. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I just gave everybody sure. the right answer. Yeah. No, that's what I got. I got point zero nine nine, but I'm just confused on the how to get. 
Yeah, it's that's the tricky part. But it's basically go to the decimal point, take the next three numbers. Okay. And then no, I the next three numbers are zero, four, five, and then the fourth one is a three, so you don't have to round up. Okay. And so you type in negative four five. Yeah, uh, yeah, I did a hundred. So, but a, a bunch of people have negative yeah, ninety-nine. I just to make sure that my yeah, I'm gonna give both of those. Actually, you know what I'll do? I'll give both of those guys correct. Here's a hundred. I'm not gonna mark that one correct. Anyways, um, let's see if you guys are clicking yeah, I just through. To make sure it went through. Did you click? I did. Did you hit send? Yes. Okay. All right. Um, let me. You know, we're going to do it again uh, on uh, Thursday, so let me get my cursor back.